Welcome. Um, we know that we're competing with a number of events today. It's that time of year, um, and we're delighted that you're here uh, to celebrate the extraordinary work of Professor Paul Lansky. Um, I have a brief introduction here uh, because we want to get to the substance of the matter. I want to begin with two quotations. We might think of them as epigraphs, as it were. Um, it is only in his music, which Americans are able to admire because a protective sentimentality limits their understanding of it, that the Negro in America has been able to tell his story. This is James Baldwin's From Many Thousands Gone. It is only in his music that the Negro in America has been able to tell his story. The next epigraph. Things we do and experience have resonance. I can die away quickly or last a long time. It can have a clear center frequency or a wide bandwidth. Be loud, soft, or ambiguous. The present is filled with past experience, ringing in various ways, and now is colored by this symphony of resonance. Paul Lansky. The resonance of the African American soldier. The story which cultivates those habits of listening that make us pause. We are delighted today to welcome you to the sixth annual James Baldwin Lecture. And on behalf of the faculty and staff of the Center for African American Studies, we've deli we're delighted that you've decided to join us and share in the brilliance of Professor Paul Lansky. This lecture celebrates the scholarship of a distinguished Princeton faculty member and provides an occasion for our intellectual community uh, to reflect on the issue of race and American culture. Uh, the complexities of race in the United States, especially today, demand the insightful work both of experts in the field and of all who share genuine commitment to the well-being of our society. Previous lecturers have included Professor K. Anthony Appiah, Bonnie Bassler, Anthony Grafton, Leonard Barkin, and Shirley Tillman. This year, we are delighted to have the William S. Conant Professor of Music Paul Lansky with us today. Professor Lansky is a pioneering figure in the field of computer, computer music and wrote one of its most important programs, C-Mix. This is stuff that's so over my head, right? Which is a kind of perform algorithm, this C-Mix program performs algorithmic composition using digital audio so sound files on a VMS mainframe computer. Is that right? I think, right? In the early days, he used punch cards to make his first electronic piece in 1973. Uh, the piece, Mild Ulisi, Fair and Gentle, was just the beginning. Uh, that piece was sampled, as it were. An excerpt was used by Radiohead in its song, Idiotech, uh, on the album K.A. Other pieces include Idle Chatter in 1985, a piece which uh, used electronically fragmented voices, uh, as the New York Times noted, to create fast, subtle changing rhythms and pitches. Uh, 78, or an earlier piece, Six Fantasies on a Poem by Thomas Campion. And of course, 1991, Tables Clear, which constructed uh, an electronic game-like soundscape derived from the banging of pots and pans by his children. In recent years, Professor Lansky has turned his attention to instrumental music. Recent works including, include With the Grain, a guitar concerto written for David Starobin, Etudes and Parodies, Horn and Violin and Piano for Bill Purvis, which won the 2005 International Horn Society competition, and Threads. He has recently been writing orchestral music and was a composer in residence with the Alabama Symphony in 2009 and 10. His orchestral work, Imaginary Islands, commissioned by that group, was premiered in May of 2010 to be released on Bridge Records. Is it out already? On Bridge Records. This native of East Tremont, the East Tremont section of the Bronx, 
son of a father who was a recording engineer and an amateur singer, and a, mo and a mother, as Professor Lansky put it, who tried on various things, a communist, you know. He went to high school, to the High School of Music and Art in Queens College in the City University of New York. He, graduate, he was, went to graduate, on to study at graduate school here at Princeton University uh, between 1966 and 69 with the PhD in 1973. He joined the faculty in 1969. What we have here is a career dedicated to pushing the boundaries, pushing the boundaries, a career in some ways uh, uh, to explore the color, that which is colored by this symphony of resonance. We're delighted and blessed to have Professor Paul Lansky with us today. The title of his lecture is A Musical Conversation About Race. The sixth annual James Baldwin lecturer, Professor Paul Lansky. Thank you all for coming, and thank Professor Glauda for his vibrant introduction. Uh, when he first called me last June I th and left a phone message asking me to present this lecture, I thought there was some mistake because I'd never thought of myself as somebody who had something to say about race. Uh, and I, I talked with Eddie, and he informed me that, that it was basically an attempt by the Center for African American Studies to expand the basis of their conversation beyond specialists. Um, and that was fine with me, um, although I still didn't think of myself as uh, able to do this. He said that it should be a celebration of my music, and uh, that's, those are words of, of those, that's music to any composer's ear. But still, I, thought of, I decided to, to think about it for a while. I looked at the lectures by Shirley Tillman and Anthony Grafton, and that he just increased my apprehension. But nevertheless, um, I decided at the end of the day that um, I'd take on the task, and I thought about it a lot. And as I thought about it, I realized that I actually owe a substantial debt to the music of other cultures, and to Amer African American music in particular. So I, pre I prepared a lecture. The, uh, there's 40 minutes of talk and 20 minutes of musical examples. It should be 40 minutes of musical examples and 20 minutes of talk, but then it would have to be called the James Baldwin concert. <laughs> so um, I'll, try to, I, uh, I'll try to get you out of here in time for dinner. Uh, but I do want to thank the Center for African American Studies and Professor Glauda for uh, inviting me to do this. It's, it's a challenge. Now, I've written my talks because I've thought long and hard about what I want to say, so you'll have to forgive me for reading it. Uh, if I don't extemporize too much, we should, uh, it should last about an hour. Um, my talk originally was going to be in two parts. The first part was going to be, uh, I was going to begin by discussing racial attitudes that I grew up with and then talk about racial and ethnic influences in my music. But I decided at the end of the day to abbreviate the first part of the talk. Um, briefly, my folks were left-wing, non-practicing Jews whose parents had emigrated from Eastern Europe in the first decade of the century. My parents were children of the, of the Depression. I was named after Paul Robeson and have distinct memories of being wheeled in a stroller at May Day parades. I was what has come to be known as a red diaper baby. <laughs> By total coincidence, uh, I grew up in the Crotona Park area of the South Bronx, which, uh, as many of you know, is widely regarded as the, place, as the birthplace of hip hop and rap. And um, that, was, that happened long after I left. <laughs> uh, the attitudes towards race, culture, and ethnicity were complicated ambivalent, confusing, and strongly influenced by left-wing politics, with an added dash of new American anxiety. A cultural manifestation of these attitudes led, oddly, to a fascination with rural American folk music. This will be relevant to my talk. When in 1992, at a Princeton conference on popular culture organized by Andrew Ross, 
Robert Christgau declared that the folk music revival was a plot between the Communist Party and the MLA, I knew exactly what he was talking about. A quick look at his website, however, reveals that he blames the Communist Party for a lot of things. Um, the role of folk music in left-wing politics is an old and uh, it's an old story and also a significant part of the labor movement. These attitudes towards race and ethnicity influenced my views, my views on their meaning in cultural and artistic context, leading to an unease about viewing art through the lens of race. It, if race didn't matter, which was more or less dogma, then neither should cultural difference. Racial difference was considered an unfortunate fact um, an unfortunate fact of nature and cultural manifestations of racial difference were therefore suspect and were implicit annoyances. Perhaps I exaggerate a bit, but you get the idea. I haven't thought long or hard enough to be able to tease out the extent to which these mindsets reflected the complexities of assimilation or disorientation of second generation Jews in a new and confusing society. I did some reading to try to see what, if I could clarify my perspectives. I read the excellent West Lerner dialogue, Jews and Blacks, and several other books, including Jane Lazar's very sensitive book, Beyond the Whiteness of Whiteness, Memoir of a White Mother of Black Sons. I recommend this book very highly. But decided at the end of the day that as interesting as my cultural introspection might seem to me, it was basically too personal, unformed, and would be reflected better in the discussion of my music. Perhaps this just reflects my genetic squeamishness in talking about race, but so be it. What I want to do today instead is celebrate racial and ethnic differences as they enrich and enliven our musical landscape. Basically, what I will do is present an annotated demonstration of the ways in which I've participated in this exchange. Let me set the stage by reporting on an experience lasting no more than 10 seconds that may be partly responsible for today's invitation. Sometime in 1984, probably November, the late Frank Lewin, a good friend and fellow composer, invited me to talk at, his, at a class he was teaching at Columbia. Frank lived in Princeton, so we drove in together. As we emerged from the Lincoln Tunnel, I noticed a group of a half a dozen or so black teenagers standing in a circle around the policeman. They were rhythmically bobbing up and down, and the cop had a bemused but friendly look on his face. I rolled down the window and was thrilled to hear an exhilarating chorus of hip-hop counterpoint. I haven't any idea what it was about, but the texture and rhythms were wonderful. Unfortunately, the light changed and we moved on, but not before I made a note to self. What a great idea for a piece. Who knows, if we had taken the George Washington Bridge, I might not be here today. <laughs> More on this in a bit. I believe that music is a form of social intercourse, and the metaphor of a musical conversation leads to an interesting set of questions. At its heart is the notion of, of reference, the way one piece of music may refer to another piece, group of pieces, style, or genre. This entails a broad spectrum of possibility from explicit quotation at one end to subtle, in, to subtle influence at the other. I have to clean my glasses, they're filthy. <laughs> okay, that's better. To subtle influence at the other. And there is a second spectrum that might be said to measure the extent to which a work succeeds or fails to absorb and internalize its references. Does the reference become an integrated part of the fabric or does it remain an appendage? T.S. Eliot's famous statement in his article on Philip Massinger in The Sacred Wood is appropriate here. One of the surest tests for success is the way in which a poet borrows, immature poets imitate, mature poets steal, bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better or at least something different. The good poet welds his theft into a hole of feeling which is unique, utterly different from that from which it was torn. The bad poet throws it, throws it into something which has no cohesion. A good poet will usually borrow from authors remote in time or alien in language or diverse in interest. This is really insider thinking by an artist working at a desk struggling to invent. While we labor, most of us have demons 
chattering away in our head and icons peering over our shoulder. As I survey my work, I notice that my references to other music occupy many points on the scale of these spectra, from implicit to explicit, from successful to not so hot. There are obvious ways in which music evokes race and culture. We have no trouble thinking of some music as Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Balinese, African, Norwegian, or noticing the cultural and ethnic origins of bossa nova, klezmer, hip hop, blues, jazz, and so on. Perhaps this is circular reasoning, since we often see these as ways in which cultural and racial identity are manifested. There are, furthermore, frequent referential cross-currents in all kinds of music. Ragtime obviously owes a debt to 19th century European harmony, and these days hip-hop has global reach as other cultures put their stamp on it. There are probably few languages or cultures today in which hip-hop artists haven't made their mark. In some musical traditions, such as Indonesian gamelan, there are experimental and even avant-garde traditions. I think that the evolution of free jazz from bebop was influenced by, I bet it was influenced by experimental American avant-garde traditions. And rap is strongly characterized by borrowing and reference. In American and European concert music, for want of a better term, while cross-cultural refer, cross references go back hundreds of years, the generation of musicians and composers who came of age in the past century when recording became a dominant form of musical commerce have felt few constraints in poaching among the many different musical cultures. It's commonplace to see a critic rattle off a range of cross-cultural influences in someone's new piece and mean it as a compliment. In terms of the two spectra I've described, reference occupies all positions from implicit to explicit, from successful to fraudulent. Risking the possibility of being called myopic, I'd even assert that it is characteristic of American European concert classical music that it feels free to trespass and graze in the meadows of others near and far. And this has been going on consistently since the 18th century at least, as in Bach's so-called French and Italian music and Mozart's Turkish music. I've often thought that rap's exorbitant and freewheeling use of any available music musical sources is a kind of payback for years of this cultural imperialism. When Puff Daddy's tribute to the notorious B.I.G. quotes the Barber Adagio for strings as, his heads in, as, as a head into his rap, which also quotes every breath you take, it's hard to object with any kind of conviction. <laughs> this is one of the two threads in my own work that I want to talk about, the use of other kinds of music, such as blues, jazz, and folk music. The second, which I'll deal with more extensively, is the use of spoken word. Both threads owe a large debt to traditions that are strongly associated with race and culture. The former is familiar, the latter a bit less so. An area of pioneering work at Princeton since the 1960s has been the development and application of music technology, particularly involving the use of computers. In 1972, I began work on a large computer synthesized piece based on a famous harmonic ref sequence in Wagner's opera Tristan und Isolde. This is widely considered to be the opening shot in musical modernism. With chutzpah typical of a 28-year-old, I named it after an aria in the opera, Mild and Liza. If I had to do it again, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> 28 years later, a chord sequence from the piece would be used by the English rock band Radiohead in the 2000 song Idiotech, and critics such as Alec Ross were delighted to make a chain of reference from Wagner to Lansky to Radiohead. I've even seen Albon Berg included in this chain thanks to his quote of the same music in the lyric suite. In the context of this talk, I noticed that from the very beginning, I was using this technology to create music that referred to other music. Unfortunately, I'll probably go to my grave having the Radiohead quote listed as one of my significant accomplishments. Well, a large part of early computer, computer music was involved in searching for new sounds. I was interested in turning the telescope earthward and finding music closer to home. In the early 1980s, I wrote a set of computer music, uh, computer folk song settings, and in 1984, for example, I thought it would be interesting to harness the power of our multi-million dollar mainframe to zoom in on the music made by a five dollar harmonica. Perhaps there was a bit of wishful thinking in this. My wife sensed this and bought me a book entitled something like Harmonica Playing for the Musically Hopeless. 
but I didn't get very far. So here's a segment of a piece which is basically a processing of a blues harmonica player named Guy De Rosa. This is about a minute long. Here I'm partly occupying the role of producer, creating an abstract accompaniment for a performance by an actual blues harmonica player. This is toward the right end of the spectrum of reference, shall we say. If I was too musically hopeless to play the harmonica, at least I could play someone playing the harmonica. I'm always reminded of the famous Seinfeld quote when George Costanza proclaims, I always wanted to pretend to be an architect. <laughs> But more seriously, I wanted to draw images of this familiar music on a broader canvas and, and have a look at it from a different perspective. At the time, I was listening to Sonny Boy Williamson and others and specifically thought of the piece as a tribute to these extraordinary musicians who could make such powerful, whining, crying, intense music with a toy instrument they could carry in their shirt pocket. A few years later, I worked to create my own blues <coughs> guitar. The ethnic references here are obvious. You'll recognize two-thirds of a 12-bar blues progression in slow motion. In my spectrum of reference, I'm moving farther away from quotation and more towards integration. This was backbreaking work on the computer, nursing each note by hand, and it might sound better being played on a $50 guitar, but then again, I'd like to think that I've created an abstract image of something familiar and that we gain a richer perspective through this artifice. Nevertheless, this is at a different point on the spectrum, farther to the left, perhaps. A few years later, I poached on blues and funk in a piece for solo marimba as I started the gradual shift to writing music for live performers rather than machines. Here's just a short segment of this.
In the mid-90s, I decided to exercise an old fascination with the melodic curlicues of North African and Andalusian music. Uh, what I did was I took a recording of, an old, of a singer singing something from North Africa or southern Spain, and uh, I improvised on it. So um, the improvisation was done in slow motion, and I speeded it up, speeded it up with the computer. This is called Andalusia. But as I've noticed, it's the norm for composers of Western classical music to use all kinds of folk music, both explicitly and implicitly. And there isn't a composer alive today who hasn't felt the need to get his hands on jazz and blues and uh, all kinds of ethnic music. The second thread I want to talk about entails the use of spoken language. Uh, speech in Western musical contexts has existed half-heartedly for centuries. The most notable early examples that I'm aware of are 18th century melodrama, as in Mozart's unfinished opera Saida, where music and speech alternate in his melologos. Uh, these are places where the orchestra plays, somebody talks, the orchestra plays, somebody talks. It's also present to a certain extent in the practice of recitative. The idea came alive in the 20th century, however, in the work of Schoenberg, Janicek, Reich, and others. With the advent of amplification and the breakdown of formal proscenia, particularly in experimental jazz and popular music, speech started to blend seamlessly with song, as in the performance art of Laurie Anderson. I've been particularly interested in the cross-currents of music, spoken word, and poetry in the work of poets and performers such as Seku Sundiata, a personal favorite of mine. I recommend that you all go to YouTube and do a search for Sundiata and a video called Blink. It, I, it's, it's really, uh, really wonderful. Talking blues, perhaps the closest thing to rap, made a cameo appearance in folk and country music, but never really took off. And of course, rap may be the most significant talking music ever. Apparently, a substantial history can be found in African music. African music, tone languages, talking drums, and what is said to be an intimate relation between African speech and music in which lines of demarcation are not as rigidly defined as they are in Western music. I was really intrigued to uh, read the article in the New York Times uh, last week about the uh, research on this, the origin of language measuring the multiplicity of phonemes uh, and uh, locating language originally in Southern Africa. And it would really be, be, uh, be interesting for somebody to do research on the origins of music and language simultaneously, um, but this is just speculation on my part. Uh, well, in English, um, the lines of demarcation are not as rigidly defined as they are in Western music. Well, in English, we commonly think of speech and song as apples and oranges, 
This is not universally so, particularly in cultures with tone languages, of which there are many in Africa. I refer you to my colleague Kofi Agawu's book, Representing African Music. He wonders if African music might not be the primary modeling system of African language. I don't know enough about the subject to be able to make a link between African and African-American speech music rap, but it is an interesting question. Nevertheless, that relation between speech and song is surely vast, ancient, and fascinating. I first became, aware, became interested in speech and music in the mid-1970s. It was not so much speech itself that attracted me as it was to make the sounds I was coaxing from the computer less sterile. In 1978, I created a set of six pieces that processed a reading of a poem by Thomas Campion by my wife, Hannah McKay, a trained actress. The Campion poem I set, Rose-Cheeked Laura, is from his Observations in the Art of English Poesy, 1602, and was meant to demonstrate that it was possible to write poetry in English using quantitative measure, as in Latin poetry. The resulting poem takes a roller coaster ride around our vowel box. It's really a wonderful poem. Rose-Cheeked Laura, come sing thou smoothly with thy beauty, silent music, either other sweetly gracing. That's the first section. You can just see him sort of touching every possible part of the vowel box in one way or another. I was also fascinated by the fact that Campion was a composer and had a musician's ear for vocal timbre. The idea, furthermore, was not so much to set the text as it was to set a skillful reading of the text and find ways to find music within speech. Each movement explores a different aspect of human speech. The first movement attempts to isolate the pitch contours by harmonizing the speech. Here are my talking Andrews sisters. These pieces use a technique known as linear predictive coding developed at Bell Labs and now in common use in cell phones. So whenever I talk on the cell phone, I can hear the artifacts and the weak, quality, weak aspects of linear predictive coding. Autotune, a device currently in use to smooth out singing and sometimes create robot-like effects, uses a similar technique. Here's the opening phrase of the last movement. In the last movement, I have the original speech and I just project the vowels in the background. I wrote another extended piece using a reading from Jane Eyre that worked well, but I felt I was spinning my wheels. My interest was transformed and galvanized by my eavesdropping experience outside the Lincoln Tunnel in 1984. It was also about this time that I first became aware of rap. I'd never heard speech music like this. I'd been aware of hip hop for several years and was interested in the ways in which its rhythmic landscape seemed to parallel that of, parallel that of early synthesizer pop but this was totally new. Well, every culture has its own idiosyncratic relation to speech, relation to speech and language. That of African Americans is central, unique, and vibrant. From colloquial to formal, from orators to poets, from politicians to ministers, from sung to spoken, 
from churches to street corners, intense language is a focal point of the African American experience. And rap is obviously a significant development within this lively language oriented culture. Now we return to my experience outside of the Lincoln Tunnel in 1984. A few months later, after a few false starts, I came up with this. And this is the first three, I'll play the first three and a half minutes of a piece called Idle Chatter. The piece is called Idle Chatter. This is not meant as a criticism of rap, which is anything but idle chatter. It refers ra rather to the inability of the piece to form a coherent English utterance, even though it appears to try. There are a number of things to notice. First, it is impossible to understand the words. This is intentional. They're not really words, only segments of words. In rap, on the other hand, the text has heavy significance. Rappers have something to say and are there to say it. It's part of their job description. Rap is intimately connected to the expression of the black experience in America, and today, even in its many international manifestations, rapper uses this medium to express strong feelings about the world around them. I doubt you'll ever hear a rap about kissing on the first date. Rap is a powerful soapbox. It gives people a voice. 
Expressing strong views about the world, however, was not something that interested me. It was not part of my job description. It was rather the expression of intense speech in a musical context, regardless of context that I, regardless of content that I found uh, sonically fascinating. Just as in my Campion settings, I was more interested in the sound of words than in their meaning. So here, I wanted my music to be about the physical act of speech rather than the expression of thought. The second thing to notice is the relentless and seeming arbitrary rhythm. I wanted to capture the rhythmic texture of rap, but at the same time, I wanted to make it confusing. I noticed that rappers typically throw caution to the wind in fit, fitting their rhymes and their prosody, and r fitting their rhymes and their prosody and rhyme are sometimes delightful roller coaster rides with lots of dips, turns, and swells. Rap's chaotic tumult of IMs, anapests, and tetrameter is here replaced by a seemingly regular beat that is based on a harebrained system rigged by overlapping rhythmic templates and random numbers. Third, and this only occurred to me recently, it's a woman's voice speaking while rap seems to be a male-dominated sphere. Finally, the word segments are tuned to approximate pitches to give the expression, the impression of the sing, of sing-song speech as sometimes, and or something between speech and song as in most rap. When you listen to rap, it seems as if they're talking, but rappers tend to hang their voices on certain pitch areas in interesting ways. I've often wondered whether my relation to words and music was skewed by growing up listening to vocal music and languages I didn't understand. Furthermore, I've never really been comfortable with text setting of the sort where a composer finds a poem and sets it to music. My Campion settings remain just one of two instances in which I've done this. In Western song, there is a broad spectrum of possible relations between words and music. In some cases, the music enhances the text, and in some cases, they have a blissful marriage where, not, where each nurtures the other. However, a classic problem that composers have in writing vocal music arises when the text, great poetry perhaps, brings along its own musical qualities, and the newly composed music has got a lot of work to do to stay relevant. On the other hand, it's easy to find instances in which the words are lame without the music. It's an interesting ex exercise to separate words and music in well-known songs. Either both the words and music will suffer, indicating a strong bond, or neither one nor the other suffers. It's a measure of different kinds of intrinsic qualities. While Embraceable You is a great song under any circumstances, the marriage between words and music is so remarkable that it's hard to imagine separating the two, although the words alone are far less effective than the music alone. Chuck Berry's music electrifies his words. You know, you just can't, I couldn't imagine Good golly, Miss Molly, or I saw him coming and I ducked back in the alley. You know, the, those words carry the music with them. Uh, Bob Dylan's words are interesting. If you take a Bob Dylan's text and you separate it from the music, music is sort of average and the words are extraordinary. Paul Simon is probably one of the most interesting cases. Paul Simon's words and music are a really intimate blend and uh, they, they work beautifully together. Uh -huh. Rappers think of the compositional process in two stages. Create or borrow some music, loop it over a drum track, creating so-called beats, and then rap on top of it. On the page, rap lyrics don't lose much by being stripped of their music, although perhaps they lose something by being stripped of their performer. I think that the structural simplicity of beats is designed to let the language emerge forcefully and unaffected by musical, musical inflection. So here we have a contradictory situation, a composer uncomfortable in dealing with the projection of text and music, but fascinated by a music that is critically about the projection of text. Shorn of meaning, however, rap is still a fascinating texture. I was quite taken by the sound of a music in which speech emerged almost as a percussion solo atop a simple musical accompaniment. And sometimes literally so, as in the case of beatboxing, where rappers push plosives into the microphone at close range. What I wanted to do furthermore was create a context in which the listener can't help but, but attempt to understand the words and perhaps even succeed in some strange way while at the same time make a coherent and compelling musical package. 
Wherever I play the piece, people tell me what words they hear, and I've played it in places as far flung as Holland, Denmark, Russia, and China, and people manage to hear words in their native language. What I found so encouraging was that rather than running for the exit to avoid telling me how much they hated my music, listeners would often make a point of coming up to me to recount what they heard. I enjoyed doing this piece so much that it, and its reception was so invigorating that it led me to a series of pieces. The second was called Just More Idle Chatter, and not content to leave well enough alone, I wrote another one called Not Just More Idle Chatter. <laughs> and here's just the opening phrase of Not Just More Idle Chatter. <laughs> After a breathing space of nine years, I wrote Idle Chatter Jr. I couldn't think of another name, so I wrote it. And here the voices speak more than sing. One thing I wanted to point out in, idle, in not just more Idle Chatter is the girl group in the background, sort of blending Motown and the South Bronx. You know, I always loved those three singers in the background swaying back and forth with microphones, so I decided to do my own. So here's a segment of Idle Chatter Jr. Uh, and this talks, and this also has got another sort of cultural reference, is a barrel house piano appears at the end of this segment. Oops. so I'm going to abbreviate uh, some things. The next thing that I did was to try to capture something about the quality of natural speech. Uh, and I did a piece where I sat down with my wife, Hannah, and we had a 
conversation, just a normal everyday conversation uh, in which I tried to process, I, I think I succeeded, I processed the words and sort of made music out of the speech. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it led to another experiment which I think failed, which I think is also interesting to play. This is called small talk and here you'll hear us talking but you won't hear the speech itself, you'll sort of hear the music behind the speech. I thought this worked pretty well and it was, it was very gratifying to hear the, the sort of rhythm and contours of speech but without actually hearing the speech itself. So I decided to try the same thing using another language and this is where I sort of fell into a trap. Um, I decided to use Chinese and uh, so I wrote, I wrote a piece called Late August. I got two Chinese graduate students to sit and talk to each other thinking that, that the rhythms and contours of Chinese would provide a different sort of landscape. Um, it didn't, but I'll play you just a bit of it. <laughs> can't bear to listen to it. Um, I thought it worked at the time, but thinking back on it, it seems, it's, it seems like a caricature. Uh, you know, I don't think I'm really integrating anything about being inherently Chinese. It sort of uses a pentatonic scale, and um, it's an interesting failure, but we all have to fail one, one time or another, and I failed lots. Uh, the final sort of speech experiment that I did was I wanted to sort of create a, I, I was intrigued by things like talking drums and uh, I decided to try to create a talking piano. So then I, I mapped a conversation directly onto the sounds of a piano and it, again it was a conversation Hannah and I had and I set my sort of rough New York dialect in uh, A flat and Mixolydian and set her sort of more gentle and cultured speech in F minor. So I'll just play a bit of this. This is called uh, Now That You Mention It. This is me. two more examples to play for you and then we'll be done. Um, they, in a way these pieces are social experiments. They tried to find the music and daily aspects of life such as conversational speech and it's ironic to me that you know I was working with this high technology and using the high technology I was able to to do something that got closer to, gr closer to the ground. 
Um, hip hop also does this in some ways. It certainly creates new proscenia. So hip hop is uh, something that you know you don't typically go to a concert of hip hop. It occurs in clubs and street corners and studios. From a traditional perspective, hip hop is really unusual music. A thought experiment I like to do is to time shift back to 1965 and try to imagine a music like this arising. From that, from that vantage point, it's almost inconceivable. I really don't know enough about rap to have a more nuanced understanding of its internal musical poetry, but I'm fascinated for, by the vibrancy of a form that thrives despite its rather rigid limitations. It can be stubbornly rigid and surprisingly lyrical. The thing I constantly notice, however, is how difficult it is to apply traditional metrics of lyricism and nuance. I didn't think much about the musical background in rap beats, beats, so-called beats, until I saw the wonderful Jim Jarmusch film Ghost Dog, in which a lot of the score by a rapper named Rizza largely consists of beats without any accompanying rap. Beats are not intended as standalone music. Shorn of their rap, they have a kind of poignant emptiness, as if they're standing alone on a street corner waiting for a bus. In Ghost Dog, this is an appropriate metaphor for the dismal, unpopulated urban landscape that fills much of the film. I really recommend this film. It's with Forrest Whitaker. It's, it's a fabulous movie. Beats are usually looped segments of some sampled music mixed over a drum track. The samples themselves are sometimes significant references as well as frequent fodder for copyright disputes. Hip hop artists discovered that it's possible to use almost anything as a source and the fact that rappers talk rather than sing makes this easier. Um, I, I uncovered a beat that uses Mozart's 25th symphony and it sounds, sounds, sounds great. I'd done enough sampling and was more interested in the relentless rhythmic quality general, generally regarded as an unfortunate byproduct of machine-made music. So not willing to leave well enough alone, I decided to create my own beat without the rap. So I've, I've sort of done the speech part of rap, I've sort of done the melodic part of rap, and here's, here's beats. Uh, I'll just play it. Short. Perhaps the final step, stop on my journey that began in 1984 at the mouth of the Lincoln Tunnel came in 2006 when Mendy and Keith Obadike invited me to contribute to their CD anthology, Crosstalk. The idea was to solicit a group of works that would celebrate the convergence of hip hop and American experimental tradition of spoken word music. Quoting their liner notes, how did we arrive at this moment where a form of speech music, hip hop, would dominate our popular radio, films, and corporate advertising campaigns, while recording studios would produce literature as influential as that produced by our major publishing houses? Some say this is what happens when the griots go pop. Others blame it on the avant-garde. So I decided to write a piece that would join several of the threads of my rap-inspired pieces. I made a few choices. First, I would use an actual text in such a way that it would become clearer over time. So I actually went out and found a, a text that I was going to set. Second, I would choose a text which had strong rhythmic texture. In this case, and in the spirit of rap, iambic tetrameter. Third, typically, I would choose a text with little social significance 
and of course from the American rural folk tradition. So I chose the Paper of Pins, which is uh, sort of an Appalachian text that uh, comes from Scotch-Irish tradition. Uh, and third, I wouldn't let I wouldn't tune the voices as I had in Idle Chatter, but rather let just let them speak. And finally, I would accompany the text with a beat-like rhythmic texture, kick drum and all. Some of you who know, know something about uh, rap will notice that my tempo is much too fast for rap. Rap is typically about 88 to 95 beats per minute, and I'm up around 120. So I dug back in my folk music toolkit and came up toolkit and came up with paper of pins about a young man courting a girl with marriage offers of various sorts. I'll end my talk with the last four minutes of this. And then we'll...
Okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs>
So I decided, you know, I, I, did, have a, I, I did have another 10, 15 minutes to of talk about this, but that's not what I'm about, you know. So my music is, I think my music uh, reflects some of that, especially in the interest in rural American folk music. So, but, uh, but still, it's not, uh, you know, it's not, um, it's not what I have to say. Somebody else ask a question. Yeah. I think I can speak up well enough. Thank you so much for your talk. I really greatly appreciate it. And one thing I'm really interested in learning more about is your approach to layering in your music. As much as I love hip hop, for example, I do not love hip hop in which the beats outplay the lyrics and outplay the sound of the rap. Um, I noticed in many of your tracks that the beats outplay the sound of the words. And I would love to know more of your experience in the layering process. And in hip hop in particular, my favorite um, types of hip hop music are acoustic hip hop, where you can clearly hear the voice, you can clearly hear the sound of each particular instrument as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, you can differentiate, well, at least I mean, there is some hip hop that is, that is obviously really about something. And my music is not about anything. Uh, but what my music is, is an attempt, it's, first of all, it's recorded music. So you could never do anything that I did live. It would be very difficult to do it live. And one thing that happens with recorded music is that it becomes old very quickly. You know, there's a real difference between listening to recorded sound and listening to live sound. So when you listen to something live, you're getting, there's a sort of danger involved. And when you listen to something recorded, there's, you know, there's no worry about anyone missing a beat or, or doing something. Now, uh, since I was re basically recording, uh, basically creating recorded sound, I really wanted to create sound that could live on repeated hearings. So um, I had uh, these sort of rhythmic patterns and random choices made so that it's a complicated thing. And the piece is now 25, 26 years old, and I can still listen to it. But the effect of the chattering was that um, it became really exhausting to listen to it. Um, so, and this is part of my whole working process in doing it. I've created all this chattering and then decided that, um, you know, I really had to lie down after listening to it. It was just such an exhausting experience. So I put in this, these background vocals. And in a way what I'm doing is I'm orchestrating the listening process. So you actually, uh, when, you have, when you have somebody perform live, you have somebody who mediates between you and the composer. When you have a recording, there's no mediation between you and the composer. So I'm trying to orchestrate the thing that the listener does with their ears. And, you, know, you, listen to something, you listen to the chattering, and then you get tired. And you get tired. So the layering, as you, as you call it, is sort of a critical aspect of this. Um, hip hop, I think, is different. I don't, I don't really know enough about it. Um, as I said, I was entranced by uh, Ghost Dog and these raps without any these beats without any rap on top of it, but that's about the best I can say. Yeah. What do you think music will be like long into the future? Oh, I haven't the faintest idea. As I said, it was, it was, if I had to predict the, the, the emergence of hip hop in 1965, it would have been, you know, an inconceivable music. Can you imagine a music which is made like this? So. I haven't the faintest idea. And that's good. So, yes? I just want to thank you for your presentation. That was fascinating. But I just wanted to raise a general question about what you understand music to be. You said it was social intercourse. And I, I thought of somebody like August Wilson who argued that black music authorized a reality that was denied by the mendacity of the mainstream in the white supremacist normative gaze. And that the music actually made truth claims so that these people could preserve their sanity and dignity in the face of the lies that they had to contend with every day. Mm -hmm. 
So you get the music after actually authorizing an alternative reality. Now, do you think that music makes truth claim? Does it make reality claim? Well, music is a different kind of discourse. Um, you know, when you sing, you're not speaking. When you speak, you're not singing. And when you sing, it does authorize you to say things that are difficult to say when you speak. So um, that's sort of the power of music. It, it enables, that's one of the beauties of, of rap and hip hop is that it enables people to get up and say things that um, they normally, you know, if they just said it under normal circumstances, it would be, a, it would be um, you know, considered a breach of etiquette or, or revolutionary. But music sort of enables it. It's very interesting to look at so-called revolutionary music and political music. Uh, very often it fails because the music itself is sort of subservient to the text. Um, I, we just had a, a graduate student do a doctoral dissertation on political music, and there's a whole range of, uh, there's a whole spectrum of possibility. But um, music that succeeds as music sort of enables you to say things that, uh, again, you wouldn't normally say, and th that speech wouldn't carry the weight. Um, so I haven't, uh, I haven't thought long or hard enough about um, mendacity or, or truth values in music to be able to say anything more intelligent about it. But uh, I do notice constantly that song enables things that speech doesn't. Something else. Well, thank you all for coming. I enjoyed it.